Tasta Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambu Dasa Homage to the Blessed Noble and Perfectly Enlightened One. Ammo Sadanto Suchedoye Olahudi Samyao Santutoshe. Wushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa by Qian Wan Jian Nan Sao Yu. O Jin Jian Wan de Shou Chi, Yan Jie Ru Lai Chen Shi Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even through billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture. Shri Fushangran, Goe Shishong Daja Omi Goho. My name is Hong Shur. We're here at Gold Coast Dharma Realm in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia, to together with you all look into the Flower Garland Sutra. It's a 10 stages chapter. Today is Sunday, April 18th. It is. It is the 18th. It is. And it's Saturday, the 17th in Northern California. Uh, you can adjust the date to wherever you are physically. So we are, uh, in, we are uh, working with the verses that sum up the 10th stage, the last of the 10 stages. So we're the last of the last. The verses repeat what we've learned when we were studying the prose part. And so what I wanted to do and what I've done the last two lectures is to give you one verse and then go back to the prose that it talked about, the, the baggage that it carried, the, the mail that it delivered, the content, the curriculum that was taught in that stage to just to summarize it and to remind us. So sometimes uh, the verses are so terse, right? The verses are just a line or two, four lines. And you might get six words, seven words to refer to an entire piece of the Bodhisattva's journey. So what I want to do is just use the verses as a springboard to then quickly, not the whole thing, because they're quite long and you know it took us years to get here, but uh, just to review and to summarize the, the essentials of it and give us uh, the, uh, uh, the tops of the waves. So if folks are caught by it, if you're fascinated by it, if you're moved by it, you can on your own go back and, and review the, uh, the incredibly profound lore of the Bodhisattva. Okay, that's the idea. So let us now pick up the text. Uh, it is here. We're going to invoke spiritual presence before we start. And we do that here. Here it is. That's what we're saying in English as we chant in Chinese. Mm -hmm. 
bring the banjo back later. We've got a song to share with everybody at the end. Here we are. Okay. We are on the uh, in case anybody's trying to find us, we're on page 84, page 84. And we're on the verse that begins, the bottom of the page, actually. Nian hui chu zu de dao zhi. That's, that's the one that we're going to work with. Full of mindfulness and wisdom, he obtains knowledge of the Tao. Okay, everybody find it. Now this is a, uh, a verse and it's chanted originally. It's not only spoken, it's not only recited. It's, there's a little bit of a melody to it. So we're gonna put a little bit of a melody uh, on it as we recite and I'll give you a line and you give it back. Here we go. Nian hui chu zu de dao zhi. In Hui Chi Zu De Dao Zhi Gong Yang Bai Chen Wu Liang Fu Gong Yang Bai Chen Wu Liang Fu Chang Guan Sui Sheng Zhu Gong De Chang Guan Sui Sheng Zhu Gong De Si Ren Chi Ru Nan Sheng Di Si Ren Chi Ru Nan Sheng Di Full of mindfulness and wisdom, he obtains knowledge of the Tao. Full of mindfulness and wisdom, he obtains knowledge of the Tao. Making offerings to limitless numbers of Buddhas, making offerings to limitless numbers of Buddhas, always contemplating supreme merit and virtue, always contemplating supreme merit and virtue, he reaches the stage of difficult conquest. He reaches the stage of difficult conquest. Who is the he he's talking about? Who is the she he's talking about? It's a bodhisattva in training uh, on his way, on her way to Buddhahood ultimately, but now enrolled in 
the Bodhisattva's Academy. That's the 10 stages chapter. This is how to do it. If you want to know classically, formally, how a Bodhisattva progresses up the ladder, up the, the escalator, up the staircase, up the hill, up the mountain to, to Buddhahood via the Bodhisattva path. We started out first stage happiness. It's about generosity, about giving, because it corresponds to paramitas, right? We're paralleling, balancing the 10 paramitas, usually six. Avatamsaka gives us four more, 10, and the 10 stages. They cross, they, they match in their sequence. So first paramita is giving, generosity. Bu shi bo lo mi in Chinese, right? It's the dana paramita in Sanskrit. So the bodhisattva gets happy, happiness. It's the stage of happiness, he's called, because if you want to recharge, if you want to charge up, reinvigorate your feeling of happiness, give. What do the Chinese say? The foundation of happiness is helping other people, says Chinese culture. That's a, an idiom, right? But it's got principle. So it's an ir, inexhaustible resource of happiness, of joy, is giving, service, helping other people out. It's amazing. And interestingly, conversely, the opposite is true. Sitting around waiting to be made happy, hoping for stuff is a recipe for frustration, right? Well, I, you know, nobody, I didn't get what I was hoping for and the stuff that I got, I want, turns out I didn't want. Buyer's remorse, right? Oh man. So flip it over, 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 flip it over. Somebody who's got the principle of cultivation in their heart says, okay, it's, it never, there's no end to the amount of joy that comes from watching people get the meal that I prepared when they were looking for another hungry night, right? Or kids at Christmas or spouses on birthdays or um, random acts of happiness, random acts of giving, right? Our good friends at Service Space uh, are, have been giving this joy to people, 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 people um, for years by talking about things like paying the bridge toll for the person behind you, right? And what was the, oh, shoot, I don't have the, the details, but during the pandemic, there was an ice cream shop. Was it ice cream or was it a, maybe it was a coffee shop. And they had a pay it forward chain that lasted for three days before it was broken. Three days of people buying their coffee and paying for the one behind them. And it just kept going and kept going. And the, uh, the baristas were like, you know, just twinkling because they knew there was something happening. And so, yeah, how long can you keep the pay it forward chain working? Be it a bridge toll, be it a cup of coffee, be it an ice cream, you know? So the happiness, the stage of happiness comes from the giving the Bodhisattva does. When we uh, dug back in using our verse as our springboard and went back into the text, we looked at the five kinds of fearlessness, the fivefold fears and how to overcome them. Okay, second stage. What's the second paramita? The second perfection is Shila, meaning that's not a girl's name. In Australia, Shila means girl, by the way. Australian uh, vocabulary. So Shila in Sanskrit means precepts means how we live, living according to virtue, living according to uh, an ethical framework, applying harmlessness to our behavior. And what did we find? We found, oh my goodness, we found the, the uh, uh, amazing, amazing 10 goods and 10 evil deeds. And we paired up five precepts and the 10 good deeds. Master Hua said, you want to 
be reborn in the heavens. You want to come back as a god next time? Yao Yan Shi Wu Jie Feng Xing Shi Shan. Hold those five precepts and do the five good deeds. And you can you will create the blessings that carry you to the heavens. How about that? Now, <laughs> interestingly, very few theistic religions can make that claim. You want to be reborn as God? Here's how, <laughs> right? <gasps> Blasphemy. You can't say that. Yeah, we did. How do you think gods become gods? They're, 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 uh, I don't ask that question. I, you can't answer that one. Well, okay. One of the reasons that I switched from theistic religion to a religion of educating and cultivating the mind was precisely that. The promise that, indeed, as soon as you set foot on the path, the promise is you will replace the founder. You become a Buddha. What a concept, right? And that's, that's just amazing still to this day. You go and say, oh, you will become Allah. You will become Yahweh. You will become Lord God. It's like, don't hold your breath. It's not going to happen. So how interesting that the, you know, the, from the prince who leapt over the wall of the palace and went out into the woods to this very day, that is the promise. Right? All living beings have the Buddha nature and all can become Buddhas if they set their hearts on it. So on the path to Buddhahood, we have the 10 goods. We have, we have the, the second stage. And in the paramitas, it's shila, paramita, which is the perfection of humanity, of a, of a good human, perfection of morality, how to be a, the best possible person. So uh, that's number two. Number three was last week. And it's the stage of fa guang, the stage of emitting light. And the paramita is the paramita of shanti, of patience. And man, what a journey. I, only after I dip back into that third stage did I realize all of the incredible um, changes that happen in the bodhisattva's consciousness as he or she uh, embarks in that third stage. You know, you, you have to see through stuff. You have to see through the idea that you're going to be happy when you finally get that last big toy you know, be it a BMW or a sailboat or promotion or your first million or whatever it might be that, that is made up of conditioned stuff comes apart. Everything comes together, comes apart. And our wisdom is based on how we react when it comes apart, right? The Bodhisattva doesn't suddenly find himself in a place where things don't come apart. It's how she responds when things break up. Can you see through the surface of them to that stage of wisdom? You're ready for the third stage, right? You're ready to, to progress on the Bodhisattva path. After that, what happens? He sees the next phase. I'm, I'm reviewing last week, right? The next, the next step was the Bodhisattva goes, yeah. And living beings hurt so much because we clings that our nature we cling to the body and when the body goes bad how do you respond you know we suffer we hurt and as a result of seeing that truth the bodhisattva develops empathy feeling with right calm passion the bodhisattva says right i need to help other people wake up and how do i do that i need to find somebody who can teach me the dharma Teach me how to teach the Dharma. Because he connects. This is the next stage. The Bodhisattva goes, right, they're suffering. Things fall apart. I see that. I'm going to let go. Other people can't let go. They're hurting. How do I help them wake up? I need to learn the Dharma. Who can teach me the Dharma? And he says, I will throw my body into a pit of fire from the tallest heaven if you can speak a single verse of Dharma for me that I can understand that I can then go help other people wake up, right? So I guess if we had to like 
summarize the third stage, it's radical reshaping of priorities. Something else becomes more important than pleasing the senses, pleasing pleasure receptors, you know, the things that the, the real selflessness of the bodhisattva arises in that third stage. So powerful. And uh, then, okay, not done yet. This is why it's such an amazing stage last week is the next thing that happens is the bodhisattva enters the dhyanas, the, the four state, the four samadhis, dhyana samadhi, first, second, third, and fourth. And progresses through the heavens because that's where the bodhisattvas who are in the dhyanas go and the real crown jewel of the third stage is psychic powers emerge shantong right the uh, psychic abilities emerge and the the stage goes into detail about what are real bodhisattvas psychic powers psychic abilities we um, back in the days when we were first learning our translation chops, we called it spiritual penetrations. <laughs> Remember? You penetrate the spirit. It's because the dictionary told us that the word tong meant to penetrate, which is one of the real meanings. But it's not the actual meaning when it refers to the Buddhist technical term of shan tong urdipada, right? So we we're calling it now psychic abilities, spiritual powers, spiritual abilities, um, things like that. Uh, the Chinese actually have a bunch of different names for it, right? Te yi gong neng is one translation, right? Shan tong, te yi gong neng, yu zhong bu tong, uh, special, special abilities. And it's really, really funny. And we, we didn't go into it quite so much this time. When we were, back when we went to this text for the first time, I gave a couple lectures on the um, how funny to have Chinese culture be totally accepting of somebody who's got shaking powers. You say, "Oh, this person's Tian Yan Kaila." They've opened their 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 spirit, their Deva Eye, and the Chinese go, "Oh, really? Hmm. Um, do you have their phone number?" I. I uh, my brother is opening up his store and we want to know if this is the right address for the place. We haven't bought it yet, but we want to find, before we close the deal, we want, you know, they are right there with somebody who has got his Deva eye, his Tian open, right? Or uh, I, my auntie died and left me money. I want to invest in some blue chips. Should I, is Apple done? Is, is Apple, or are they still on the road up for, should I buy Apple stock? You know, I want to talk to the person who's got their Deva eye open so they can tell me, you know, totally ready to accept that. While, where I grew up, the only, the only time that you on an ordinary day would run into anything other than what your senses told you would be if you went into the old part of town and there would be a building maybe standing by itself and there would be like a lightning bolt or a, 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 a crystal ball and it would be madam olga psychic right madam olga and you'd go into madam olga and she would you'd, you'd want to leave your wallet in your dash, in your, your love compartment, don't take your wallet in. And cause you, you know, as soon as she gives you the story you feel a hand in your back pocket, you know, th there was total, total mistrust of anybody who pretended to have psychic powers. It was considered a scam or where else would you find it? You'd go when the circus was in town or the sideshow, right? The, the, uh, um, the local caravan, you know, has pulled up on the edge of town and they're passing through and it's the fair and you go to have your fortune told, a fortune teller. And a fortune teller, most people immediately just discount it. 
you know, it's, it's a shuck, it's a joke. Fort, you had your fortune told. There were, and, and probably always will be in human society, a certain number of folks who are completely open to the possibility that this individual sees more than I see, hears more than I hear, knows more than I know. They can know the future, they can know the past, they can know my past lives, they can know my thoughts, they can see beyond the veil, they can hear, you know, clear audiences. That are... Some people just believe it. And astrologers survive on that portion of humanity that is open to the possibility that this individual has special knowledge, right? Before I became a monk, I flirted with being an astrologer and um, there were some people who sought that, that knowledge. They wanted me to tell them things. They were totally open to hearing. There's an equal number, maybe a greater number of folks who go, you believe in that nonsense? That's a lot of baloney. That's a malarkey. Ah, boy, you're gullible. There's sucker born every minute. You know, they don't believe. They don't believe in anything that has to do with the idea that this individual could know more than I do, right? So here we have human society with these different acceptance or utter rejection of psychic powers. All right, so to the point where um, if I'm explaining Dharma, if I'm sharing you know, my reflections on Dharma, I have to know my audience. Got to know who you're talking to. Um, if my audience is largely an Asian audience, people who've had a generational exposure to Buddhism, I can talk about um, Master Hua had dragon disciples. I can talk about why the monks and nuns take seven grains of rice before lunch and go out and go, you know, to the great golden winged pung bird, to the Raksha mother and all her children, to all ghosts and spirits in 10 directions, this is an offering to you. May you share it equally among you. You know, why do we do that? Well, it's because we're feeding the, the, the great golden winged pung bird and offering to the spirits and to the ancestors. If I'm talking to a Chinese audience, I can talk that way, right? And people go, hmm, this is what monks do, right? If I'm talking to a modern Vipassana audience, people who came through the door of mindfulness, who are interested in Buddhist psychology uh, and perhaps a sense of, you know, wanting blessings from doing good, I have to censor myself. I can't share that entire side. And <laughs> because uh, when I'm, particularly when I'm in Berkeley, uh, I, I live in a community where I speak Chinese during the day as much as I speak English. And the audience, uh, the, the people who come to support are largely Vietnamese disciples or Chinese from Vietnam. That's our particular affinity group in Berkeley right now. And uh, yet every night at the Institute for World Religions, which is the other name of the Berkeley Monastery, we have a different group, right? There's the Vipassana group from Spirit Rock, the East Bay Insight Meditation Community. Then we'll have Jewish Renewal group. Then we'll have a Hindu group come in. Then we have a yoga class. And then we have uh, the Zen group come in, you know, and then we have uh, another sutra lecture group. So every night is a different group. I, I remember I, I learned this lesson one night when James Barras, who's the Thursday night East Bay Insight Meditation Group founder and, and senior teacher, he had a retreat going on. He called me up, said, Hung Shirt, sure, could you teach for me Thursday night? Sure, James, no worries. So, I thought, okay, great. So here I am. They are used to, to insight meditation, right? Where it is psychology based and 
you, uh, Dharma is for the purpose of understanding yourself, improving your, the quality of your life, getting happy, right? So I was talking and uh, telling stories and unaware, I switched over uh, to, I started talking about diet and how it was really good to be, a, a, you know, eat a harmless diet, be a vegetarian, maybe a vegan, try it, you know, it's really good. And besides, well, I was explaining how we feed the pung bird, you know, we're, and of course we wouldn't want to feed meat to a, to a pung bird. And, and watching the audience, just their eyes widened and their jaws dropped and Q and A and uh, Michael, one of the original, uh, one of our neighbors who was one of the original sitters, excuse me, excuse me, Dharma. He said, I, but with all due respect, he said, we, we want to learn about Buddhism. Why are you inserting yourself in our dinner plate? Well, I didn't come to have you tell me what I should eat. And what's this about dragons? Isn't, don't you think that's utterly superstitious? You know, and I'm like, oh, wrong audience. <laughs> yeah, I, I forgot. Okay, let's get back to, yeah. Well, how can Buddha Dharma, you know, work with your skandhas, this sense of, you know, sense. so completely, completely different ends of the human spectrum are drawn to different affinity groups. And the Buddha Dharma gathers everybody in. So if on Thursday night, I had this section of text last week's section, we're still talking about the third stage. And I said, okay. Tonight, we're going to talk about the Deva eye, the Tian Yan. We're going to talk about the Deva ear, the Tian Artong. We're going to talk about the 18 special qualities of the Arhat, the Shen Zu Tong. We're going to talk about the Su Ming Tong, knowing past lives. We're going to talk about Ta Xin Tong, uh, knowledge of others' thoughts. And the most important, the one the Buddha has, the demons can't have this one. It's the Lo Jin Tong, the end of outflows. Demons don't get, they can get the other five. You know, you were aware of that, right? That group would go, I think we're in the wrong monastery, you know, or bring, you know, send that guy out and bring in the real teachers. You know, we don't want to hear all that. So one day I having, you know, learned the hard way that, that uh, different cultures expect different Dharma. I, I asked Master Hua, I said, Shifu, why is it? that Westerners don't want to hear about psychic powers and the gods and the dragons and the Eightfold Pantheon? He said, Haizal. Haizal. Tam Bugo. Bugo Bugo. He said, still early. They're not there yet. The Chinese have been looking at the Dharma and looking at each other, looking at humanity with a historical record for minimum 5,000 years the Chinese tradition of looking in the mind and finding a, a Buddhist answer is 2,500 years, not quite, it's 2,000 years. The, the Buddhism got to China around the, the Han Dynasty, the, the time of Jesus, roughly, you know, in and around. So they've had a longer look at the mind and the world and each other. In the West, you know, science came was science would put Galileo in jail, right? So we know that it's only been 500 years since we started to uh, measure the world. And anything that was not measurable was rejected as suspicious or in, in, insufficiently investigated, right? So yeah, we're still Haizal, we're still early. So at some point, maybe this will be admissible. Um, interestingly, interestingly, if we wanted to his, put it on a timeline, when did the West start to look, uh, to, to expand the possibility that the mind contains more? It might be when things like pandemics keep us indoors and things like uh, things like mindfulness apps hit the Apple store by the thousands, right? People start to look within 
they're going to discover that science can't measure consciousness yet, but consciousness has to somehow be accounted for. We have to find a language that accounts for consciousness. And this is cutting edge right now. And leading the way, leading the way is physics. Laboratory physics is the, the thing, if, if consciousness becomes quantified, if there's a way to actually measure it, it will be through brain science, through physics, because physicists, the, the discipline of physics, asks the right questions. Like, what is this? How does human life work? How do we know what we know? Right. And that, to, to be able to measure that, where do you go? Well, you go to somebody who's been measuring it for 2,500 years, the Buddha. There's a vast language for measuring consciousness. Welcome to the fourth ground. That's where we are. Full of mindfulness and wisdom, he obtains knowledge of the Tao, making offerings to limitless numbers of Buddhas, always contemplating supreme merit and virtue. He reaches the stage of difficult conquest. Okay, these, the last line of the four is taking us to the next, right? There's 10 in a row. So we only are looking at three, three lines. What is knowledge of the Tao? Yo, that's fascinating. Um, we heard today, uh, every Saturday afternoon, um, we've been listening to Master Hua's early disciples tell their stories of how they first met Master Hua. And today um, was Lani Bauer, who was Bhikshuni Hungyin, one of the first five Americans, Caucasians, to, to leave home, to become a nun. And as Lani told her story, she said, she grew up middle class in, an, in a suburb of Seattle, Washington. And what made the difference to her was she read the Tao Te Ching, Lao Tzu. Me too. My first real encounter with something that was not stories of Jesus from a Christian, from a contemporary Methodist perspective, Sunday school was the Tao Te Ching. And I saw a bilingual copy from Seton Hall University, the Lao Tzu, the Book of the Tao. And I absorbed that insight and took it to my Sunday school teacher and challenged him with it. Mr. Alley, tell me, uh, what, what does it mean that the spirit of the valley, that the eternal feminine, its use is inexhaustible and its function comes from what's not there, what's missing? What does that mean, Mr. Alley? You can't ask that here, son. Well, I've got to go somewhere where I can ask that. Bye. And I walked out because that was wisdom. And the way Jesus was presented was super watered down and wimpy. Jesus looked like a California surfer. And it was just everything was good and kind. And it was wimpy. It wasn't for young minds in the 60s. We wanted something that spoke to our situation. And here was the Tao Te Ching. You know, the Tao is the, the one you can name is not his final name. Tao Ke Tao Fei Chang Tao. Ming Ku Ming. Fei Chang Ming. The things that have a name, Yo Ming, Tian Di Jishu, it's the beginning of all of creation. The thing without the name is the mother of all existence. Right? And you go, oh, uh, uh, hmm. once again, <laughs> that, that, <gasps> that, ooh, that's deep, right? I wanted that. And Christianity had the depth, but they watered it down for the kids and yeah, couldn't hold me. So, full of mindfulness and wisdom, this bodhisattva obtains knowledge of the Tao. What is that? What is knowledge of the Tao? I thought this was a Buddhist text. Well, it is. So the Tao here is Marga, Sanskrit. It's the path. 
You could also translate it, what is our favorite word these days? Journey, right? Knowledge of the journey. What? Bodhisattva journey, right? The path to Buddhahood. Hmm. Path would work. The way would work. The Tao works. So I left the translation Tao because it brings up all of those words. Way, path, road, journey, even method of how, how to, the way to walk, right? It's a road, so you can walk it. That's why it's the road. If nobody walked it, you wouldn't need it. You wouldn't have the Tao. Tao ke xing, hu xing, he you Tao, right? Where is the Tao if you don't walk it? So, okay. And then makes offerings to limitless numbers of Buddhas and is always contemplating supreme merit and virtue. And he gets through the fourth to the fifth stage. Okay. What is the fourth stage about? It's about serious cultivation. Okay, step back. What happened in the third stage? The Bodhisattva saw that people are suffering and he really wanted to help them. And then he said, oh, how do I help them? The Dharma. I need a teacher. I'm gonna learn the Dharma. So he says, I'll do anything for more Dharma. And what he gets allows him to transform desire and enter the dhyanas. And then because he is determined to help, psychic powers arise. Psychic powers arise only after compassion. So that wish to help is compassion. And it's not so you can play with psychic powers. So you can know what that cute girl in, in history class is thinking about you, you know, not, you know, adolescent fantasies are not a reason for psychic powers. It's because you've witnessed suffering and you understand that the Dharma can help. Okay, so fourth stage, What's the paramita equivalent? Vigor. The equivalent of the third stage was patience because you have to sit still. You have to see through stuff and not move, right? The best things that you got break up and that's a shocker. Bodhisattva can handle it because he's practicing patience. Fourth stage, vigor. Vigor is virya paramita. Vigor is the virya in the Sanskrit roots, the same word that becomes viril, virility, meaning strength, right? Sometimes we translate vigor, sometimes translates strength, which means what? It means in cultivation, you got to come at it again. You got to come at it again. You got to come at it again. You got to keep going for there to be what? A change in consciousness a change in consciousness. There are transformations going on here. So uh, if, we, uh, if we use the word mind ground, people are familiar with mind ground as a, as a way to refer to the Buddhist teaching. The mind, it's an analogy, mind is a garden. So you see this incredible lotus there on my screen? That'd be, that was photographed right outside the door here. That's a, a lotus from where I'm sitting, just 30 feet out there. It's a Queensland lotus. And the lotus grows because you've prepared the ground, which in this case is water for the lotus. And it's tuber. They come out of these tubers, kind of like a cucumber, like a sweet potato. And the lotus has this skinny stem and up comes the blossom, right? And you have to keep the water in it just right, right? And then it grows. So the mind ground is a garden. You have to prepare the garden. Our bodhisattva on the fourth stage only wants to undergo the transformation in consciousness that is going to be needed for him to be able to teach. Okay? So that's... Okay, this is step four out of 10. 
this step has to do with commitment to practice. The, the word in Chinese is xing, as a verb, it's a picture of walking, left step, right step, left step, right step, vigorously, commitment, committed to walking the path. So what is the fourth stage? It's a whole bunch of practices. When you say that same word in, uh, as, a, as a noun, it's hung, fourth term. So they're called pusa hung, bodhisattva practices. And the, uh, it's, it's not the most engaging of texts because it's a long list. What comes up in this stage is called, oh, not that one. I want this one right there. Not that one. One more time. Try this one. That one. It's called the 37 factors of enlightenment. Oh my goodness. Right? Don't go to sleep yet. It's called the Bodhipakshana or the Bodhipakshika Dharma or the Bodhipakya Dhamma in Pali. And they're called qualities conducive to awakening, otherwise known as limbs of enlightenment, otherwise known as Bodhi share dharmas, otherwise known as wings to awakening. All ways of translating the Chinese called them san shi qi dao pin. Three, ten, seven. Dao, that's the path, that's the way, that's the word dao, pin. Chapters, sections, factors, limbs, wings, right? That's the, the Chinese Mahayana's way of translating bodhiya, bodhi, pakya, dharmas. Bodhi, that's enlightenment, pakya, factors, dhamma, practices. 37 factors of enlightenment. Why 37? It's because the bodhisattva at this point really means it. He or she is now committed to transforming consciousness so that he can embody his wish to help, right? At this point, this is pure heart motivation. There's nothing holding him back. He's seen through it. He's seen through it. Okay, so far so good. Now, look at it. There's this four of those. There's the four of those, four of those, the five of those, the five of those, the seven of those, and finally, the eight of those, right? 37 in all. Sam, what's that? I can't hear you. I'm not sharing my screen. I am. Yeah, I'm sharing my screen. That's, that's what you're seeing. That's the screen share. Yeah. So there are 37 things, 37 steps. That's a lot, right? But what is it? What we're looking at is a traditional, meaning the oldest, oldest of traditions, meaning before time. This is the Dharma for molding a Bodhisattva and equipping him or her with what he or she needs in order to do what their vows have told their heart to do or what their heart have directed their vows to do, you do it backwards too. So they want to help, they really want to help. They know that just ordinary reactions, I love this, I hate this, this really touched me, um, this really made me angry, that kind of reaction to the world is not going to be enough to teach. So they need to change. These 
boat 37 wings to awaken are how this is the how to really become a different being reborn from the dharma okay so is that enough of an intro that we can look at these i i, I do it this way so that i want people to see the system and understand that now here i gotta i gotta say it differently here fundamentally these all exist in the mind ground all of these qualities that this list of 37 brings out are all there but they have to be carved out the way a statue exists in marble before the sculptor puts his chisel and hammer to it okay it's all there waiting you know rodin looked at a block of marble and brought out his incredible figures right the bodhisattva to be is waiting inside our mind these dharmas are how it's carved out all right my mixing metaphors got everybody boggled the uh, corn and beans and squash are there in your garden once you plant the seed water it, cultivate it keep the kids and bikes and cats off it and harvest it corn beans and squash all there right but you have to bring them out of the ground you didn't plant them anywhere but the ground the ground grew all that food but you had to bring it out the mind contains a bodhisattva we have to cultivate it out. These are how. This is how it's done. There's a change happening. Change is going to come. Sam Cook. It's going to happen. I believe. Yes, it is. So the Bodhisattva undergoes the training from his or her oops, commitment. There it goes. What are they? First, si nian chu, four applications of mindfulness. You are mindful of the body. You're mindful of your feelings. You're mindful of your thoughts. You're mindful of dharmas, translated here, mental qualities. Okay. So mindful, you, you are aware, you're tuned in to those. Okay, now there's another, and, and notice it says the Mahayana does it this way, but the Theravada has a different set, interestingly. So I'm saying we can go into these at great depth and you could have an entire, you know, month long retreat paying attention only to these four foundation of mindfulness. And you might get a clue. You might be able to do it. That's one. What else? Si Zheng Qin, four correct places to apply effort, endeavors, four perfect efforts. Let go of negativity that is currently there. Prevent future negativity. Enhance current goodness. Plant the foundation for future goodness right this bodhisattva think about it as the mind right this bodhisattva in training is going in there with a pressure hose i don't want i, I know i used to be greedy and angry and deluded and and proud, prideful and doubtful and i'm going to go in there and clean it out so this is a change in consciousness okay what happens next? This is a tough one. This is one that people all stumble on. It's the foundations of psychic power. For as you will, to, it's a very interesting pun. It's here, feats, F-E-E-T-S. This is the word for feet in Chinese. Our translator gave us an English feats, supernatural feats. Uh, it's a pun. It's a, right. So there are four wish fulfilling qualities one aspiration sometimes translated as desire whoa 
Two, happy with effort, hard work. Three, mind, concentration. Four, inquiry. Like, uh, nope, don't quite get what that's about, right? Okay, so there you go. Now, a pair. There are two, five, two lists of five. There, gun and li. Gun is faculties, inherent, innate faculties. Li is the strength that comes when you transform them. Okay? They are pairs. What are they? The idea is we got these things. These are in there. Faith. That first one. Look at that. That faculty of faith. In um, When I do a uh, refuge ceremony, there's the, the, uh, the, the refuges and the precepts. Um, one of the things that you, we have a repentance. There's a great renewal, a washing clean before you can do, before you can take refuge. Uh, right? You repent of being an Ichantika. What is an Ichantika? An Ichantika is somebody who doesn't have this. What would we say now? We'd say cynic or like terminal cynic. Somebody who was, their mind was so poisoned, so sour, so toxic in uh, disbelief of all government, you know, disbelief that a, you, you could say people who are rejecting the virus, uh, I'm sorry, they're rejecting the vaccine, maybe are terminally cynical because they have no faith that government can help at all. And so they will do things that hurt themselves and hurt society because they simply are deficient in faith. Now, okay, that's one thing. The other thing though, faith means, yes, I believe. What about if I lack believability? If I myself am not don't have integrity. I lack integrity. This first root, the first faculty. It's called a root, right? In Chinese, gun, but it translates as faculty. If I myself don't have enough grit to be believed, if I'm not believable, how can I then believe in others, right? So it's definitely both sides. I lack faith, but I am unfaithful. Oh, I see. So where do you learn that? In the 37 limbs of enlightenment, it's innate. It's a gumban yo da right? It should be there fundamentally. Okay, number two, things that you accept, you say this is true, I get into action with them. Vigor, joyous effort. I put my faith into action. Then, number three, mindfulness. That's now a, a buzzword. We were paying attention to that. We hang on to the things that I believe in and I've now put into practice. I keep them in my mind and Samadhi arises. Ding. For the first time, there's a transformation because of mindfulness and vigor on the things worthy of belief, like cause and effect, for example, the Dharma, for example. Samadhi arises and wisdom comes from Samadhi. Okay. That's fundamental abilities. Five powers, you do it. Same things, only now there's been the change. Consciousness is transformed. And these are now strengths. The, my faith is a rock. <laughs> there's a, a, a digression here. 
My faith is a rock. Uh, when I was established uh, in manager of Berkeley, Berkeley Monastery, Berkeley is right in between City of 10,000 Buddhas and Gold Sage Monastery. Gold Sage is down in San Jose, 50 miles away. City of 10,000 Buddhas is in Ukiah, 100 miles away. So for years and years, I would Sunday morning drive down to San Jose, 50 miles, give a lecture, get a bian dang, get a bento, right? A lunchbox, eat it on the way back to Berkeley, swap out my sutra, drive to City of 10,000 Buddhas, lecture on a sutra, and come back that night, 300 miles on a day in my, my uh, Subaru. Coming back at 9.30 on Highway 101 from Ukiah to Berkeley, 100 mile drive, it's California, we do this. I would tune in, somebody had clued me in that if I went to 1100 on my AM radio dial, I could tune in to Mount Olive original apostolic holy church of God with Pastor Fosdick delivering today's message. Right? It was what? It was a recorded radio broadcast of a charismatic Christian preacher. Uh, Dr. Fosdick, she was one of the uh, rare, and, and I don't know if they're, maybe they're going strong, I hope so, these rare people trained in the tradition of African Christian preaching. And the Mount Olive, AOH, Apostolic, Original, Holy Church of God, Mount Olive, AOH, Church of God, came to us from um, <coughs> um, where's the church? It's in Silicon Valley. It's in uh, where was it? Not Cupertino. Uh, it's a church, an urban church down in Santa Clara County. And Pastor Fostick would uh, take to the, 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 the microphone, take to the recording, and she would ask for where we are in the gospel. And somebody would say, it is, uh, you know, it is Acts 12, 42. I could be way off. She would say, Acts 12, 42. Thank you, my sister. It says, Jesus is my rock. Now, Jesus as a rock. Yeah, a rock is solid. And then she would start. And she would go for half an hour at, while I was driving. I did it to stay awake. I was, you know, passing through Windsor and then passing through Santa Rosa. And, and Pastor Fosdick was into her preaching. And she had a quality where she would, uh, the spirit would come upon her. The Holy Ghost would come upon her and she would start to, to uh, preach in a remarkable, <laughs> remarkable quality. And she would just take a sentence like that. Jesus is my rock from, you know, the gospel. And she could stretch it out and in 30 minutes, she would have, I would be sweating as I'm driving, you know, because I was into it, you know. She, <laughs> and then there, there was an organ behind her and the organ was slowly building up with chords and boom, 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 boom. she'd build it up. And she had, you believe him, by the time she was done. And then it would always end up with the same announcer. He says, and now if you would like a copy of tonight's message for your very own, Mail in $5 to Menlo Park, Mount Olive, original, apostolic, holy church of God. And we will mail you a copy. You know? <laughs> yes. You know? But it was, uh, she, had, you, she had people moving in the church. 
and she was on her knees. You could hear she, you know, it'd be telling you, giving you the good news about the gospel. And I, I would always reflect, you know, I had just come from my lecture, my preaching, and everybody was going like this. They were. Listening, you know, sitting still. We do stillness really well. And Pastor Fosdick, she had the church move and you could just feel the building swaying, you know. How different, how different styles of faith. She had her powers going. And mind you, the Mount Olive Church was, uh, I think later they ran into to financial difficulties, but she uh, put hundreds and hundreds of young people through school and delivered thousands of meals every year to people who didn't have food. They did incredible good works in Menlo Park. That was the town I was looking for. So uh, I always enjoyed, uh, and my guess is they might still be on, I don't know, it was 1100 on the AM dial, Mount Olive, original apostolic, holy church of God. Talk about power going, the roots going to the powers, the five roots go to the five powers. Okay, we're now, we're at the last two of the 37 limbs. And these are, the, the all 37 are called Daopin, factors of the way, limbs of, of awakening, limbs of enlightenment, right? But inside the 37, there are seven that are called Chuejir, limbs of Chue, awakening branches of awakening. So there's a smaller group of seven. Collectively, they're also known as the seven. And I need to say, when you get to the Pali tradition, to the Theravada tradition, particularly in books like the Visuddhimagga, the uh, path of awakening, they take these very seriously. And the 37 are a system for measuring uh, a cultivator's progress. So these 37 are shared by the Theravada tradition. There's Mahayana version, Theravada version. And uh, there's, as you progress through, you know, what, how have we gone? We've gone from the four stations of mindfulness to the four right efforts, to the four wish fulfilling feet, to the five roots and the five powers. Every step along the way, has its corresponding development. And a good teacher can look at the student and go, they're progressing through, they're, or they're stuck here, they need to do this. In order. So these are profound uh, teachings for practice. They are xing, practicing the bodhisattva's pusa hung, bodhisattva's practices, why he or she wants to transform. They want consciousness to be purged of shadows, darkness, ignorance. They want to put their hearts behind, committed to whatever it takes to help others wake up. Okay, so far so good. What are the seven? Number one, investigating dharmas. Si fa right? You select dharmas. You select, you pick out dharmas that you're going to cultivate. Maybe you're going to be pure land. Maybe you're going to be mantras, right? You pick one up. What do you do next? Same as above. You do it hard. Jing jin, bigger. You do it again and you do it again and you do it again. Notice they use the word joyous effort. That's good. This is virya, strength, jing jin, right? You repeat it and you repeat it and you repeat it with strength. What happens next is so interesting. She, you get happy. Happiness follows vigor. Look at that. That's so interesting, right? Now you and the Tao are starting to correspond. Okay, what happens next is called Qing An. 
Chang'an is a state of samadhi that precedes or parallels the dhyanas called light ease, right tranquility. It's subtle, serene, okay? Next is nian, mindfulness. Next is ding, just like the powers. Look, nian, I'm sorry, nian and ding. Huh, these two, these overlap, don't they? So in other words, what? The bodhisattva is now shaping his or her mind into a bodhisattva shape. That's what the, the, the wings of awakening, the limbs of enlightenment are about. He is committed to transformation. Doesn't want to mess around anymore. He really, really wants to do this work. Nobody's paying him. Nobody's praising him. It's hard. It's sweaty. You're changing. You have to let go of so much. And then look at this. You get to this place called show. This is fascinating. Equanimity, even-mindedness sometimes, tranquility sometimes. This is the fourth of the uh, the what are the, the ones that four? Um, once again, boundless hearts, a boundless heart. That's not a medical condition, understand. It's a state of mind, right? The four Brahma Viharas, that's the word I was looking for. Boundless hearts, correct. The four, this is the, the fourth of the Brahma Viharas, Upekka in Pali, Upeksha in Sanskrit. What does it mean? It means you've come out the other side and you're transformed. Things look the same. Somebody gives you a million dollars. It's like, oh, that's a lot of trouble. Somebody steals your million dollars. Oh, you got the trouble now. It's your, your trouble. <laughs> you know, it's the same. You don't, you don't move anymore. There's been a transformation in consciousness. Okay. And the last one is our old friend, if you have studied Buddhism in college or high school, world religion class, you heard about the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Path. Here it is. And it's Zheng every time, right here. Zheng, eight kinds of Zheng. Translate is correct? Yeah. Sometimes translated as right. I like to translate it as wise, wise views, wise thought, wise speech, wise action, wise livelihood. Look at this. Here it is again. Jing Jin, wise effort. Here's mindfulness. Oh my goodness. And here is Ding, repeated. Nian, mindfulness, leading to Ding, Samadhi. Same as here. Mindfulness leading to samadhi, same as here. Mindfulness leading to samadhi. So what's happening is, and I'm gonna flip it over to bring it into, a, I'm gonna flip it. It's not that the bodhisattva gets stuff, it's that he now with hammer and chisel in hand out of the marble, of his own nature, her own nature, has chiseled out the shape of a bodhisattva, has made those fundamental dharmas emerge from the nature. They're there already. He's now, through repeated effort, in a formal way, brought those qualities to light in his nature. They're yours now. And they start to function, right? Consciousness has been transformed. So, Think about it. What a lot of work. This is so much effort to change yourself so that when faced with your sister getting on the back of that motorcycle again and riding away with that guy with the greasy hair, <laughs> you go, How, oh, if I suggest that that's that she, you know, it's not a good idea. Would she believe me? 
if you've transformed your consciousness, you, you can be believed because you're different. You know what to say. When you see people refusing to get vaccinated because they want freedom. When the governor says, we're gonna have to close the doors. You know, Brisbane here, locked down for three days over a difficult Easter weekend. And everybody did it. She said, masks, mask up. Everybody did. I went to uh, an appointment. I didn't have a mask. Everybody else did. It's like, oh, I, I haven't been out for a while. Everybody in Queensland masked up and locked down. And those cases went away, right? So when you see people out of some misguided notion, listening to wrong advisors, you know, not, not getting vaccinated because they, they want to be free. The Bodhisattva knows what to say. He knows how to make sense. So they change their thinking and go towards the good. Now, I want to uh, have a piece of the fourth state. Here's the fourth ground that we worked on. This is how we explained it. And look at, okay, we're now at the end of, of those, uh, the, oh, the fourth stage text lines out every single one of those 37 limbs. And at the end of it, what happens? This bodhisattva knows kindness that has been rendered to him. He knows to repay kindness. His mind is receptive to the good. He's pleasant to associate with. He's upright, gentle, not difficult, free from pride, accepts teachings and advice easily, and quickly grasps the intention behind things people say. Check that out. After going through this transformation and gaining all these qualities that were there inside, they're functioning, they're working for him now. What's he like? The sutra tells us what the bodhisattva who has undergone this training is like. You know what? They're really nice, <laughs> really kind and gentle and thoughtful of others, realizing how much has been given to him, her, and wanting to repay it. When people have something that they can learn from, they're right on it. They pick it up quickly. They're not hard. They're not proud. Give them advice. They go, oh, thank you. Thank you. And they get people's intention. Their humanity is enhanced by the training of the Bodhisattva. Isn't that interesting? I, that's just, I, this passage is so helpful because you know, what do we think? Oh, I'm a big cultivator. I've got 37 limbs of enlightenment under my belt now. You know, no, not that. It's, oh, that's really helpful. Could you say that again for me? That's, thank you for that. You know, Because they are truly committed now to being in a life in service to others. Anything that will work, they want it. This is stage four on the way to 10 right remember when we got to nine he was the da fa sure the real dharma teacher because at that point they were able to use so many different techniques to help people wake up all right vigor it's all about jing jin jing jin also i want to show you something here Let's make that bigger. Um, here's something that I thought was interesting. At this point, moreover, within all those Buddha's dharmas, the Bodhisattva leaves the householder's life to cultivate the way, cultivates and regulates even more his deep mindset of faith and understanding. Passing through limitless hundreds of thousands of millions of nitrogen beyonds, he makes brighter and more pure all of his wholesome roots of goodness. I thought it was interesting that the Bodhisattva here, it specifies that the Bodhisattva becomes a monastic. Why? No time to do anything else. <laughs> to do all of this work, the Bodhisattva has to focus. 
has to really put their hearts on it because there's so much to do full time, full time. There's a great story about the uh, seven, the seven limbs, the seven limbs of enlightenment within the 37. Um, there was a monk in the Buddhist time who was really sick. He was, had one of those diseases that attacks the skin and he was, had boils and smelly, pussy things running in the body. And none of the monks wanted to get near this Dharma brother. And usually, you know, in every community, there are people who connect with the principle that helping others recover from illness is doing the Buddha's work right? The sick are a field of blessings. And if you don't mind getting in with the smelly, dirty, bedpan changing, diaper changing uh, work, you, it, it helps you, you know, to serve others that way. So nobody in the Buddha's community in this monastery could stand being in the room with this sick monk because it was just too gross. And word of this, news of this came to the Buddha, and he personally went to the Kuti, where the monk was lying, you know, more sick than, than alive, more dead than alive. And the Buddha asked, he said, why isn't anyone taking care of this monk? And they said, we can't. We tried. We tried all our different remedies. There are monks who are healers. They couldn't make any difference. The Buddha personally went in to the, to the uh, monk's hut and said, ah, uh, how are you? Uh, I'm really sick. He said, do you know why you're sick? I don't know. I wish I could. I want to get better. Buddha said, all right. He said, um, I know something about your past lives. He said, would you please for me, recite the names of the seven limbs of awakening. Let's see how well you've done your homework in Dharma, he said. And so the monk said, oh, uh, I know the first one. It's uh, investigating dharmas. Very good. The monk sat up a little straighter. He said, what's the second? Oh, well, the second one is uh, vigor. Once I get that Dharma selected. And he, now he's, his face clears off. You know. Very good. What is the third one, said the Buddha? Uh, the third one is, uh, um, it's a Ching'an. Uh, no, 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 it's happiness, happiness. Amidofo, I think we're wrong. Sure's connection probably went out. Uh, maybe just in the brief uh, period before he comes back, I can just make a few announcements um, before we know what happened to the monk. Uh, so tomorrow evening, which is Sunday, Dharma Master Hung Lai will be doing a Q and A around Dharma questions. 
um, from 7.30 to 8.30. So that's Sunday. You can find the information at the berkeleymonastery.org website. Um, we're also going to be moving our afternoon Guan Yin and Amitabha recitation to 12 to 12.30 p.m. because people would like to join the 10,000 Buddhas Repentance, which begins at 12.45 p.m. So if you've been joining us every day to recite the Buddha's name or Guanyin Bodhisattva's name in the afternoon, please join us at 12 p.m., 12 p.m. Um, so I'm just gonna share the website. Okay, I can do that one second here. Um, Okay. Hi there. Chin uh, <laughs> Chuan sure has already given us some instruction, some information. Announcements for BBM that yeah. time. We have a pattern here. We've we've now learned that uh, uh, indeed we have a what forty five minute limit or something like that. This is the third week we've had our our. Uh, our modem break right at that point. And it's too bad because it was such a good story and I'm right at the point, okay. So I was really, like Brian Conroy told me yesterday, I had to leave my story yesterday. Boy, that's really a cliffhanger, he said. Uh, okay, so back to the story. The story goes, I got just enough time. The monk recites the seven limbs of enlightenment and gets, recovers his health. And the Buddha says to all the astonished monks who are peeking in the doorway, how is this possible? They all say. The Buddha says, in the past, this brother slandered the proper Dharma. And on one hand, if you say, don't believe in this, this is nonsense, this is not true, this is, you know, ridiculous garbage. When you're referring to the Buddhist teachings, on one hand, you're demonstrating your lack of xin, gan, the root of faith, and so you don't have the power of faith either. But more importantly, you're also obstructing other people's interest in and ability to pick up the Dharma. You have really harmed others, xin, gan, by slandering, by saying bad words about something that can take them to awakening, that can end their suffering for limitless lifetimes. So in the past he did this, but because he has applied himself in this lifetime to the proper dharma, he got the retribution for the slander in the past is nobody wanted to get near him because he had said illness producing words, the illness to your dharma body. He said, but today, you saw him speak the names of the seven limbs of enlightenment, the seven wings of awakening, and the power of these dharmas to transform consciousness and help you wake up is su such that all you need when the Buddha asks you is to recite the names of the seven limbs and you return to what is proper. Their power to transform consciousness is such. So all the monks go, oh, powerful. That's good. Shanzai, Shanzai, Shizun. Well done, Bhagavan, you know. So there we go. And it's about practice, right? So I was thinking, I was a brand new novice monk. I was, it was my 1975, I had just left home. I hadn't taken the precepts yet, but I was already in a robe and had the job of, of ringing the bells and bowing with people. We went to Los Angeles, uh, and there was a big gathering, which turned into, it was at the invitation of Helen Wu, Hu Guoxiang, one of our longtime faithful disciples. And I was uh, still struggling with my sweet tooth I was still more interested in what was for lunch than almost anything else, you know, the work I was doing. Master Hua was going down to Los Angeles 
I got on the airplane with him to do the refuge ceremony that happened in Los Angeles, the largest refuge ceremony in American history at that point. Nearly 100, 100 plus, 120 people took refuge. Amazing. But my mind was on lunch. And I remember we were picked up at the airport. We drove to the home where the first lunch was going to be. And I was knowing that my, my no, I was wanting to see what was for dessert on the lunch table. And the other part of my mind was ashamed of that. You know, I, I was struggling in my mind with desire and I'm now a monk. I can't just be so ordinary that I, all I want to do is eat delicious flavors, right? That's not right. That's not the Dharma. So in my mind, I was going back and forth and Sherfu was being looked at by all these LA disciples who'd heard about the famous Chan Master Shen Hua coming down from San Francisco and they were all, you know, he was the big spotlight on Master Hua. And right at that point when we were coming in, he turned to me and he said, you know, all these practices, they're really for use when you need them. He said, I sense that you could use some calming down. He said, why don't you go, is, is this bedroom available? And, and they said, oh yes, please, sir. He said, why don't you go in here and, and cross your legs and meditate? We'll wait. Just, just meditate for five or ten minutes. Why don't you do that now? And I'm like, okay, sure, fool. And, and I went into the room and crossed my legs. And sure enough, immediately I discovered that my eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind were all outwardly focused. I wasn't comfortable in my robes. I was a brand new monk. I could barely hold my precept sash on, you know, without it tripping on it. And I was, you know, down in Los Angeles with my teacher. I was going to, wanted to impress him. I didn't want to screw up. And I, you know, my mind was chaotic. And the kind-hearted, good and wise advisor picked me out in that moment and said, you can go meditate. That's what meditation is for, to calm your body and mind at a time when there's lots of pressure on you, nervous, right? And just his, in the middle of a million busy things, when it was his moment, he was more concerned about calming his young, brand new disciple. And I, 10 minutes later, I came out, uh, thank you, Shurfu. He said, okay, ring the bell, it's time to do ceremony, right? Shangong. And my mind was calmed, and I, my energy was, was back. But I'll never forget that lesson, that these practices are for use when you need them. That's why they're they're given to the bodhisattva who wants to, you know, transform his consciousness. But I hadn't connected. I was doing my work and doing my job, and it's like, oh, actually my job is cultivation. That's my work. Not dealing with a hundred things, including lunch, you know. <laughs> uh, the next, we did a Shangong, and I remember the lunch table had three kinds of cake, two kinds of pie, ice cream, and uh, Snickers bars all wrapped up in a big bowl. Th there was more sweet desserts on that table than I had seen in a year at Gold Mountain Monastery. And I have to say, I think I took a, a sweet roll, something. I, did, I just went right past all that because having Shurfu point out that I should start to meditate as a monk, you know, it was, I was full. And all that delicious dessert, although I still remember the, the sight of it, it didn't move me as it had, you know. And without his pointing out that I should meditate, I probably would have dived into that, that lunch counter and had a, you know, a glucose rush or, and then a crash. But that flavor of meditation filled me up and I didn't need the sugar that way. So what a good 
you know, you think of how the Bodhisattva at this point has transformed consciousness. I was, I hadn't even connected meditation as a monk, you know, so. Okay, limbs of enlightenment. Next week, how does it go? Next week, we reach the stage of difficult conquest. Next week, the fifth stage. Hubba hubba. All right. Okay. Uh, Jin Chuan, you want to continue with your, or was it Jin Wei Shi? I guess it's Jin Chuan. Jin Wei is down on Highway 9. You want to tell us more about what's going on? I'll bring up our. Sure. If you just bring up the Berkeley Monastery website, I already announced it, but I'll announce it again because there's some important events coming up. Um, so first, uh, starting tomorrow, there's going to be the 10,000 Buddhas Repentance. Honestly, I'm not quite sure what the schedule is because I've been hearing from people it's been changing. Uh, so I would recommend if you are planning on joining that to uh, whoever, yeah. wherever you got the information from, you just might double check. Uh, the website? It's not coming up. Uh, there we go. Got it. Okay. There you are. But in terms of my information, at least, the latest is 7 a.m. They're going to begin the 10,000 Buddha's repentance tomorrow. Okay. Where, where do we go to find what you want? If you go to cttbusa.org. Okay. It's on the front page. cttbusa.org. So you right below all the news about the pandemic. You'll see April 18th to May 17th. One more time. C T T B USA. There it is. There it is. Okay. Um, where do we find it? Here we go. You see it? It's just you just scroll down there, right there. and you'll see. Uh, and then you via Zoom, and that, that's a link. So if you were just to scroll over that 10,000 Buddha's repentance via Zoom, that, that's a link. Yeah, that one right there. Yep, that's a schedule. So it looks like it's starting at 7 a.m., first incense. So for those who are joining, and then 1245 will be the afternoon incense. And because we're because of that, we are actually changing the... Uh, no, it looks like they're trying to make it possible for people who are working also to join. So it looks like Monday through Friday, it's just in the morning and the afternoon. So we are, we'll be also changing our Amitabha and Guanin recitation from 12.30 to 1 to 12 to 12.30 um, because of the 10,000 Buddha repentance. We got some requests. And so that way people can join our Amitabha or Guanin recitation and, um, and still join the 10,000 Buddha's repentance at 12.45. So I see the information there on our website. Um, and then tomorrow evening, Sunday, April 18th, Dharma Master Hung Lai will do a second part of his Dharma Q&A. He was quite popular last time. And so there was a request for him to continue to answer some questions. So if people are interested, there's a Zoom link there and you just join in. And I mean, if you have questions, you'd have to send it to Dharma Master Ching Yong, and he's been compiling questions so that we can ask Dharma Master Lai. So if you have questions around repentance or the 10,000 Buddhas, um, that'd be a good opportunity to ask him. And maybe one more thing, actually, I'll see on the website. We also, Dharma Ram Buddhist University um, is also accepting students for the BA program and the MA program. And so if you are interested in, I would say, education, especially kind of tuning into our inherent wisdom, um, reflecting on the Dharma principles with a good community of good friends. Uh, this, this is a oppor really opportunity to kind of to join DRBU. All the classes will be in person next semester in fall, most likely at the City of 10,000 Buddhas. And I believe the deadline is probably um, mid-May. So you need to kind of sign up soon if you want to start this, this upcoming semester. Um, I don't know what else to say about it other than uh, it's, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to try to answer it. Oh, I was going to say, um, it's actually a very good place to kind of shift from if you're thinking about exploring something in a new occupation or a new field, 
or perhaps even interested in pursuing the spiritual path more deeply. And COVID kind of changed your conditions. Actually, Dear View might be a really good place to explore to kind of deepen your reflections on where you want to go in life or if other people you know might be interested. Okay, that's it. All righty. That's good. Thank you. Lots of lots of things going on in line. And we're, uh, you know, the opportunities for folks to participate since the pandemic have really increased by being online because uh, you can just go to your computer or your phone instead of instead of having to get in the car and drive to the monastery. So when uh, we're all safely vaccinated and herd immunity has established itself, uh, we'll have to decide then how much, of, um, how much of it is going to go right back to in-person bowing. Probably will, probably will. But there will still be some activities available online for folks who really like the, the chance to hang out at the Berkeley Monastery Buddha Hall all day and have something going on. So we'll see how that works as we go. Alrighty, we now are going to transfer the merit. Um, we're using our mantra, Medicine Buddha's mantra, um, to do that and uh, hope people will find a place to send your merit that you know will be a benefit. every week that kind of gains in energy so if you keep it going during the week okay should we bow three times to the buddhas To the Venerable Master. Okay, how many folks did we have today on uh, YouTube? Had 80? 
and the Chinese uh, 80, we're gaining, we're growing. It's great. All right. Thanks, everyone. Had 150. That's a good, stable number. Okay. Thanks for joining. See you all next week.